Don't think we've been properly introduced. I'm James Bigglesworth. My friends call me Biggles. Biggles, a British-produced sci-fi adventure film, was released in the UK on Friday the 23rd of May 1986. It was released much later in the USA on the 29th of January 1988 and was renamed Biggles Adventures in Time to appeal to the US market where the character wasn't quite so popular. Produced on a small budget of $7 million and despite being highly promoted and receiving a royal premiere, it unfortunately bombed taking a mere $1.45 million on release in the UK box office and a paltry $122,000 on its release in the United States. It was planned to make a Biggles film based on the success of author W.E. John's 100 Strong Biggles Adventure book series as early as 1968, taking inspiration from the success of The Blue Max. A movie was planned entitled Biggles Sweeps the Skies that would be financed by Universal Pictures. Pre-production work was completed, James Fox was cast to play Biggles, and he appeared in promotional material. However, the film was cancelled due to budgetary and location problems. The rights were sold to Biggles Stories in 1976, but the film remained in development hell for several years. To keep costs down, new, cheaper screenplays were written, and a deal was struck in which investment company Foreign and Colonial and insurance brokers the Robert Stigwood organisation would provide the necessary finance, meaning that Biggles was a British film entirely funded by British investment. The film was produced by Yellow Bill Films, headed up by producing couple Kent Walwyn and Pom Oliver. The script was written by screenwriter John Groves, who went on to pen the late 80s War of the Worlds TV series, with story elements provided by producer Walwyn. Early versions of the script were written by mask writer Michael Fallon, and called for an adventure film in the mould of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and would have been much more faithful to John's original novels. It is claimed that because Back to the Future was released and became a major hit, the script was duly altered by Warwin and John Groves to follow this trend in an attempt to capitalise on Back to the Future's success. However, this is somewhat of a movie myth, as Biggles had already completed filming by the date of Back to the Future's UK release date of December 1985. Groves, however, would pen the later script for The Back to the Future Ride. The movie was directed by John Huff, who had already directed several movies for Hammer Films and Walt Disney Productions in the United States, and had box office hits with Escape to Witch Mountain and its sequel, and would later go on to direct horror schlock American Gothic and Howling 4. Huff had read the Biggles books as a child and was available after a deal to direct the James Bond film fell through. He was attracted by the unconventional story and signed to direct in 1984. As the ED levy, which ensured that a proportion of money spent on British cinema tickets in the UK was used to fund the making of British films, was due to be revoked, it was suddenly realised in 1984 that filming had to be gone before the end of March 1985. The film was rushed into production, even before they knew for certain that they had the money to finance it. The plot follows Jim Ferguson living in present-day New York City, following through a hole in time to 1917, where he saves the life of dashing Royal Corps pilot James Biggles Bigglesworth after his photo recon mission is shot down. Before he can work out what has happened, Jim is zapped back to the 1980s. With the assistance from Biggles' former commanding officer, William Raymond, Ferguson learns that he and Biggles are time twins, spontaneously travelling through time, where one or the other is in mortal danger. Together, Ferguson and Biggles fight across time and against the odds to stop the Germans changing the course of history by destroying a sound weapon. The film stars Neil Dixon as James Biggles Bigglesworth, before Neil Dixon was cast, Dudley Moore and Jeremy Irons were both considered to play Biggles. Neil later reprised Biggles' character in all but name, in It Couldn't Happen Here in 1987. Neil would go on to star also in that year in Lionheart, starring Eric Stoltz. Although he wouldn't star in a lead role again, he has gone on to have a long career starring in many TV roles and has made a great career with voice acting. Alex Hyde White plays businessman James Ferguson. He was best known for starring in the unreleased Roger Corman movie Fantastic Four and is the son of Hollywood actor Maurice Hyde White. The film was both Dixon's and Hyde White's first leading role in a motion picture and the pair have become lifelong friends. I say, let's kick some ass, old boy. The great late Peter Cushing stars as William Raymond in his final feature film role. Peter would have worked with Huff on one of his many Hammer classics, Twins of Evil, in 1971. 
possibly the reason for him being cast. Fiona Hutchinson plays Debbie, Jim's love interest. This was her first movie role. Fiona was well known in the States for starring in the long-running TV soap opera One Life to Live. Marcus Gilbert plays Biggles' rival Von Starline. Marcus later starred in Rambo 3 and in the Evil Dead sequel Army of Darkness. The late William Hookins, famous for appearing in many genre films of the era, including Flash Gordon, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace and Batman, stars in one of his lesser known and least successful roles as the preppy yuppie Chuck. Francesca Gonshaw plays Biggles' love interest Marie, best known in the UK for starring in the first three series of the BBC hit comedy A Low A Low as Maria. Australian actor Michael Sibbery stars as Algy. He has worked mainly in TV shows, most recently in the hit TV show House of Cards on Netflix. The late British character actor James Saxon plays Bertie. James will be recognisable for his extensive TV roles in the UK. Daniel Flynn plays Ginger. Daniel is the son of Doctor Who actor Eric Flynn and he is the brother of Ripper Street and Soldier Soldier star Jerome Flynn. Daniel mainly worked in TV and has worked successfully as a voice artist. The casting of the film is one of its strengths. Peter Cushing dominates every scene he is in. Neil Dickson is also very well cast as Biggles. However, he, as well as Algy, Bertie, Ginger, are given very little to do, with Biggles relegated to being a supporting character in his own film. The film also takes much liberty with the storyline of the original novels. In addition to the introduction of a science fiction plot, Biggles is much older than in the books, where he is only a teenager in 1917, and the characters Ginger and Bertie feature, although they don't join Biggles until much later in the book series. However, the presence of Biggles' friend Algy, adversary Erica von Sarlein, and love interest Marie fit with the early books in the series. Principal photography took place over six weeks between January and March 1985. Cinematography is by Ernst Vincey, who would later work on the Madonna and Sean Penn movie Shanghai Surprise. The Biggles was such a well-known and fondly remembered character in the UK, the production team were given permission to do things that other filmmakers would not have been allowed to do. The filming was mostly shot in London. Tower Bridge and the surrounding area were extensively used, including the Tower Hotel, which doubles as the film crew's base of operations. Also various locations in the home counties were used. Veteran stuntman Jerry Crampton coordinated the action sequences and designed the stunts for the film, while second unit director Terry Coles, who had done similar work on the movie Battle of Britain, was in charge of filming the aerial sequences. The film includes a scene where Biggles lands a helicopter on a flat wagon on a moving train. This was filmed at the Nen Valley Railway and was apparently the first time such a stunt had been attempted. Fifteen takes were needed before the director was satisfied that the sequence was finished. The helicopter was flown by renowned stunt pilot Mark Wolf. The Sopwick Pup, which crashes near the start of the film, was specially built by Sky Sports Engineering. The crash was unplanned and the scene was rewritten to work around this. Some of the aerial sequences were shot near Millbrook Proving Grounds in Bedfordshire. The 1917 weapon testing ground scene was shot at the Beckton Gas Works, which a year later was used for scenes in Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, and had been the location for the pre-title sequence in the 1981 Bond film For Your Eyes Only. The sound weapon appears to be based on a real-life sonic device that the Nazis were working on during World War II. The weapon itself was a custom-made fiberglass dish mounted on a mobile crane. It was filmed at the former London Brick Company works in Bedfordshire, as were the Trent scenes. The exterior church scenes were all filmed at All Saints Church, Holdenby, and the courtyard scenes were filmed by the stable blocks of Holdenby House. The period aircraft seen in the background during several scenes belonged to the Shuttleworth collection. Several aircraft were used in the film. These included a stamp SV-4, which is flown by Biggles, the stamp was flown by Stuart Goldsbink, and a Boeing Stearman, which is flown by his arch rival Von Starlein, was piloted by former World War II bomber pilot John Jordan. These biplanes are actually from the 1930s, as flying and maintaining actual World War I aircraft was considered expensive. The stamp was later seen in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The soundtrack was composed by Stan Islas, and released by MCA Records on vinyl and cassette tape. Stanislas composed a soundtrack for the movie Stalin, and like the film, the soundtrack drew mixed reviews because of its experimental themes which seemed out of place in a period adventure, and heavy use of synthesizers. Unfortunately, the soundtrack has not been released on CD, so I'm using a recording of an old version from the LP for this review. John Anderson, frontman of Yes, wrote the lyrics for the film's signature song Do You Wanna Be A Hero, as well as Chocks Away. A track by the legendary Queen bassist John Deacon in his second solo outing with the group The Immortals provides a track that is used on the film's end credits, called No Turning Back. Biggles was highly promoted when I was a kid in 1986, 
A special on the long-running BBC TV programme Blue Peter highlighted an extensive behind-the-scenes with interviews with the cast. To promote the release of the film, the story was also published in newspapers in comic strip form and promoted via ABC cinemas with discounted tickets. Given all this, for some reason I have doubts whether I actually watched Biggles on its release in the cinema. I think it's safe to say although the character was most successful in the 30s up to the 60s, I think the character had been much lamented by the 80s, often mocked, especially in the Russ Abbott Madhouse comedy show shown on UK TV. This definitely put me off seeing the movie. Like many, I believe I watched it on the small screen on its VHS release. John Huff stated that the film did go into profit later through television repeats and video sales. Like many movies trying to recreate the success of Indiana Jones, such as the 1985 movie Young Sherlock Holmes, with this infamous CGI stained glass night scene, which also failed at the box office, Biggles falls to the same fate. What to do with an out-of-fashion and out-of-time hero? His obvious flaws come from the Rust production to secure financing, which leaves huge plot holes and trying to squeeze in the time travel plot, which is incoherent. One minute Peter Cushing's character, Raymond, knows exactly what is going on, and is explaining events to Jim Ferguson. The next he's ignorant of the events in his own past, asking Ferguson what happened. There are no Back to the Future timeline issues here. It seems such a shame that after the perfect casting of Peter Cushing, he is wasted on poor writing. Perhaps an opportunity was missed in the story about the time travel. His character never appears in his youth in 1917, just elderly in the 1980s, to tie the two timelines together, which leaves the events feeling disjointed. Jim's time travel always reminded me of the later hit TV show Quantum Leap, although Sam's time travel has a much more robust plot device, rather than the weak time twins trope, we are both called James, very weak. Also plot holes such as one moment the despised character Chuck, who Jim has only employed because his uncle runs a bank financing Jim's company, is trying to have Jim arrested or sectioned, believing him to be a religious transvestite bank robber, ends up becoming his best man. The movie tries too hard to be like Star Wars, explaining the casting of Peter Cushing and William Hopkins. Plot elements like Luke holding the plans of the enemy's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, and facing the black helmeted Vader in a space dogfight. Biggles has photographs of the enemy's ultimate weapon, a sonic device, and faces the black helmeted Von Starline in an aerial dogfight. However, credit has to be given to the aerial sequences, and the stunt work is excellent. However, it is obvious that Biggles is flying over the peaceful British countryside and not the war torn Western Front. He is above snowy green landscapes, not a war torn no man's land. There can be no denying that a lot of time and effort was spent on making this film, as it has some really enjoyable moments. You can see that it was trying very, very hard to be good, but never quite manages it. Frustratingly, whenever one satisfactory moment appears, a truly dreadful one is not far behind, sabotaging all that has been achieved. Also, the lightning time travel effect rotoscoping looks quite cheap. Although I have to admit, once the movie finally gets going, and after several recent viewings, I have a soft spot for this movie. Who can deny the out-of-place catchy soundtrack? And I just love the scenes around the sonic weapon testing ground. That desolate landscape matched with Stanislas's score and that often cut from broadcast eyeball scene really have great moments. Again, these plot elements obviously would make more sense in World War II, or would have solved many of the movie's easy-to-spot anchorisms. In 2000, a new film entitled Biggles Flies North was announced, after the rights to the character in the books had been sold on a prospective shooting date of 2001, and locations were to be filmed in Malaysia. Nothing, unfortunately, has materialised. Biggles is available on a great Blu-ray release, which has a fantastic transfer and is displayed in its true aspect ratio but is sadly lacking many extras. Despite his obvious flaws, Biggles is a fan favourite, a true cult movie. When I recently questioned was it a forgotten movie on my Facebook page, I was met with a resounding no. If you love this movie as a kid like so many did, I think you would notice all its faults upon reviewing. However, I would recommend a viewing if you did not catch it in 1986. It may just grow on you. It's not so bad it's good, it's just an odd use of the character that sometimes feels made for television but I guarantee you'll want to be a hero by the end of the movie. Looks like this town is nuked. Nuked? What's that? It's American slang word. It means to uh, overreact. Come on.
Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and if you enjoyed the review, look out for my previous reviews and future videos. And please consider subscribing and thanks for watching. I'll speak to you on my next review and once again, thanks a lot and I'll speak to you soon. Take care.